Let's open our Bibles back to Genesis chapter 3. We've been looking and we're continuing to look, and next week we will try to complete our look at Paradise Lost. This morning, God, when He looks at us, looks at us and describes us in a very unique way. The Scriptures tell us that when God describes our three-part makeup that, that God differentiates between in the Scriptures, He says, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless to the coming of the Lord. Now, most of us, when we think about ourselves, we think of ourselves as a body, a soul, and a spirit. If you didn't notice that, it's exactly opposite of God's description of us. God sees us primarily as a spirit which has within it a soul with emotions and desires inside of a body which is decaying and and going back to dust. We see ourselves as a body that has all these needs and then we see ourselves as a soul with all these desires and then a spirit which we don't know very much about. It's interesting that when we get to Genesis chapter 3, when Satan attacks Adam and Eve. He attacks them right down the line of our human comprehension of ourself. He starts on the outside with their body. He continues from the outside to their desires and their soul. And then he corrupts their spirit. And it's interesting that just what Satan does to Eve is what the Apostle John in 1 John 2.15 says that all of us are going to struggle with the lust of the flesh, that's the body. The lust of the eyes, that's our soul, our emotions, our, our whole aesthetic desires. And the pride of life, that's our spirit. And this whole knowledge and, and intellect part of us. And that's exactly how Satan attacked Christ in the, in the wilderness. He attacked his body, mixed stones into bread, attacked his, his uh, whole emotions and his soul when he says, jump off, you know, and do that thing. And then the bow down deal was the pride. And every time Satan attacks, he always attacks the same way. Let me take you to verse 6. And that's all we're going to get to this morning because it's so important. To look at the actual fall. We've only seen for four weeks the temptation. Satan, remember, wants us to doubt God's goodness and his authority and to to doubt his plan and to doubt that he in his word has spoken. And we've seen those temptations. But now, after being tempted, 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 verse 6 says, When the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, She and was desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. There is the actual act of rebellion, of disobedience, and of sin. And what happens is that we, through Adam's willful going along with Eve, we have the derivative effect of being lost, hopeless, helpless, unable to find our way. That's where we find ourselves after verse 6. But let's take verse 6 apart. Because we as humans are so lost, we're unable to find our way back to God unless He Himself aids us. Remember, that's why the Bible says He came to seek and to save that which was lost. There's no one that seeks for God. That's what the Scriptures tell us. What a terrible state, and how did we end up so lost? Well, here in Genesis 3, we find that lostness is what began at the moment of the fall of Adam and Eve. They found this. And let me just read to you what theologians have said describe the effects of the fall. The eyes of their conscience were open. Obviously, they were in innocence before this. And then they received a conscience which knows good and evil. So the eyes of their conscience was open. Their heart began to smite them because of what they had done. They'd never known that before. They'd never done anything but good. They'd never been anything but pleasing God's sight. Now, all of a sudden, they had that horrible feeling of having done wrong. And then when it was too late, they saw the folly of eating the forbidden fruit. They saw that their happiness fell away from them. They saw misery falling upon them. They saw their formerly loving God provoked. They saw His grace and favor forfeited and receding. They saw His likeness and image that they bore lost. And they saw the dominion over the creatures as it began to dissipate. They saw their natures corrupted, depraved. They felt an internal disorder in their spirits which they had never before been conscious. They saw a law in their members, as the Apostle Paul says, which began to war against the law of their minds. And that law of their flesh began to captivate them, both to sin as well as to wrath. 
They saw that they were stripped in the sight of God. They were deprived of their honors, of their joys. They no longer were welcome in paradise. They began to be exposed to all the miseries which would come from an angry God who was just and holy. And they were disarmed. All of their defenses were departed. They were ashamed, forever shamed before God and His angels. They saw themselves disrobed of all that they had, degraded from their dignity, disgraced from their high standing, and laid open to the contempt and reproach of the God of heaven. But worst of all, their own consciences. Well, Satan wants to ruin us like he ruined them. And this morning we're going to look at how he attacked them and how he brought them from temptation, which everyone is tempted, to sin, which we have to choose to consciously participate with. How do we avoid Satan's three-way attack? And what we will see this morning demonstrated in verse 6 is that Satan's plan is to destroy our relationship with God and the tragedy of paradise loss is that it worked with our first parents. And since it worked, he's going to come in the same three doorways. And what we see is in the Garden of Eden, we find Adam and Eve resisted the will of God. This morning, this is the revealed will of God. Are you resisting it? Secondly, we saw the Word of God was rejected. God says, don't eat from that one tree. They rejected His Word. And finally, the way of God was deserted by Adam and Eve. Let me just show you what I mean by a threefold attack, and then we're going to go deeper into another portion of Scripture and read it all together. But look at verse 6, and let me take it apart into the three-way attack. Because since God has described us as three-part beings, spirit, soul, and body, And since he says we have spirit, souls, and bodies, it's in that very way only from the outside to the inside that Satan attacks. He starts with our body, goes to our soul, then he defiles our spirits. And Satan's threefold temptation of Eve followed the three-part nature of man, which follows the three-part warning of John. Bless the flesh, bless the eyes of pride of life, which follows, interestingly enough, the three pronged attack in the wilderness that Satan unleashed on our Lord Jesus Christ. They're all the same. They're all linked together. Let's look at it with E. Verse 6, the first few words say this, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food. So Satan, first of all, appealed to her physical appetites, which are part of our bodies, which we were born with. We have hungers, we have needs. Secondly, Satan attacks her nature's emotions and aesthetic desires in her soul. Look what it says next. And pleasing to the eye. What she said is, this is beautiful. More than I'm hungry for it, I want it because it's aesthetically pleasing. That's the lust of the eyes. And, and sometimes we, we differentiate between how awful those lusts of the flesh are. Those are those drug addicts and drunkards and, and terrible, wicked, immoral people. But we kind of like people that like aesthetically pleasing things. And there's just as much lust for aesthetically beautiful things as there is lust for the base things of the flesh. Both can be extensions of fulfilling wrongly a good desire. Then look at verse 6 at the next part of the temptation because finally in verse 6, Satan begins his appeal to her mind. He tries with the mind's pride of knowledge and insight which has its seed in our spirit And by the way, it says that in 1 Corinthians 2.11. It says, no one can know the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him. So it differentiates between our thoughts uh, of our soul and our spirit, which can know them. And it says in 1 Corinthians 2.11, so no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So there's a a differentiation between the mind and the spirit. But it says in verse 6 of Genesis that Satan appealed to her mind when he showed her, it says, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she saw it. It looked good like it would satisfy her body's desires. It was pretty, which would satisfy her aesthetic desires. And it would make her smart, which was the whole pride of life thing. So that's how Satan triumphed over her. And look look at the sad results. Look at verse 6. And so she took of its fruit and ate... And Paul tells us she was deceived. Then she goes to the one who was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. He 
willfully partook in the transgression, the scriptures tell us. And look at this. And she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Did you know the Bible never blames the fall on Eve? It blames it on Adam. The scriptures say it was Adam who chose willfully to enter in the transgression, and because of Adam's sin, it passed to all of us. Well, now, turn with me to the Gospel by Matthew. This is what we're going to read together this morning. Because I don't want to just, uh, just spend our time looking at the negative, looking at the disaster, to look at, at uh, the first Adam's failure. The Scriptures describe Jesus Christ as the last Adam. They describe him as not the second Adam. Jesus is not the second Adam, like there's a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth. There is the first Adam, a literal historic person we saw in our creation series, that God created the first human being on this planet, the first uh, upright, standing, walking humanoid, and and none of these leaky things uh, were prior to, to Adam, the Scriptures say. So Adam was the first Adam. Jesus Christ is the last Adam. He is the, the culmination of the curse of its effect in the fall. And that's what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 4 because in Matthew 4, the last Adam does not fail. And when we read this, it's almost like the conclusion to the story. We see the, the innocent, sinless Adam and Eve standing in the garden and they are attacked in these three ways and we find them failing on every hand. But we also find a sinless and perfect Lord Jesus Christ. As he faces the same attacker, as he has a body and a soul and a spirit, and as he gets confronted with the same temptations, and yet he triumphs. And that's the blessing of the Scriptures because the triumphant account of Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, can open the eyes of our understanding to see how wherever Satan comes, when he comes through the body channel, the lust of the flesh, when he comes through the emotional soul channel of the, the lust of our eyes, and when he comes through the spirit channel of the pride of life, no matter where he comes, we can, like Jesus, say no. Now, we don't always do that. We're not perfect. We fail at times. But we can say no to sin. Matthew chapter 4 And we're going to read together the first 11 verses and pray. Would you join me standing before the Lord as I read and you follow along in your copy of the Scriptures, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Remember, Adam and Eve were in a perfect, weedless, bugless garden. Jesus goes out into a desolate, barren, cursed, fallen world wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, so his body was crying out for nourishment. Afterwards, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him, verse 3, and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. You see, the first temptation was a legitimate desire. There's nothing wrong with being hungry. There's nothing wrong with wanting to eat. But he says, I don't live just to eat, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, I want to take a moment, as long as we're on this verse, not to harp on it, but it says it. But by what? Every word. Every word. You and I hold every word of God, the revealed will of God. Have you read them? Have you asked God to teach you every word? Continuing, verse 5, Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. It's interesting. The devil can quote Scripture. He knows Scripture. He can use it at will. Verse 7, Jesus said to them, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord. Your God. You notice the devil just misuses Scripture, misapplies it, but Jesus, like a dagger, a sword, exactly has the Scripture for each of these temptations. Verse 8, And again the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And some commentators say it could be you know, the highest mountain in the world or it could be Jericho. 
because Herod had built a replica of the Roman Empire in his summer palace in, or his winter palace in Jericho, and he had little models of every Roman province, all the known world. And, and so it could be they were looking for the Mount of Temptation down at that. And he says, I'll give you everything in this world represented here. Or they went to Mount Everest. It doesn't really matter. It just was a temptation. And look at this. And he said, all these things, verse 9, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. You shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, your word is so beautiful. Uh, just reading these words is such a treasure to us. There were no apostles that accompanied you into the wilderness to record this event. There were no prophets that followed you off into that wilderness to write down a, an inerrant record. This is a gift. You gave this account by your Spirit, to your apostles. Though they were not there, you gave it to them to share with us so that we could learn Satan's attack plan and how we, like our Savior, can be victorious. This morning I pray for one here this morning who has never yet learned the truth of saying no to sin and yes to the Savior, who has never learned the sword of the Spirit and how it can be wielded by faith through the power of your Spirit to bring victory. But also we ask for any who are with us this morning who don't even know you yet, Lord Jesus, who are still running from God like Adam and Eve did and have never turned and said yes to your great gift of salvation. We pray that your Spirit would draw them, prepare their hearts, and would grant them repentance this morning. All of this we ask because we're so thankful for you, Lord Jesus, and your great salvation. And we magnify your name which is above every name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen? You may be seated. In chapter 4, you and I are looking at how differently God and Satan work. Satan always starts with the outside, starts getting the body interested, attaches the mind, and defiles the spirit. God, on the other hand, begins in the spirit, convicting, moving, calling, directing, sealing, saving, Regenerating, renewing, and then that continues to the mind, which is to be brought into captivity, and then the body follows in sanctification. How totally different God and Satan work. God works with us as creations from the inside out. He starts with our spirit, he gains control of our souls, and then our bodies are his. Satan works oppositely. He attacks the body, he gets the soul, and then defiles the spirit. Here in chapter 4, we meet the last Adam. And this is the scene of the last Adam and how unlike the first Adam in the Garden of Eden is to the last Adam whom we meet, the Lord Jesus, in chapter 4. Just a few contrasts. In the Garden of Eden, Satan challenged Adam. But Jesus, in the wilderness, challenges the devil. The devil ruined the first Adam in the Garden of Eden, but Jesus spoiled the devil. He crushes his head on Calvary. The first Adam involved the whole race in his defeat. The last Adam includes the whole race in his victory, offering salvation. The first Adam dealt a temporary defeat to God's creation. The last Adam brings everlasting righteousness. What a contrast. The first Adam stood as the head of the race, and falling, he dragged the race down with him. The last Adam stands as the head of the new race, and being victorious, lifts that race with him. And all who come to him, he gives them that everlasting righteousness. The first Adam's work caused death, and it could be undone, and it was undone at the cross. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ's work, can never be undone because what he brought is endless life and endless righteousness. The first Adam did merely the work of man, but the last Adam did the work of God. And let's look at that work. And let's just take apart these 11 verses in Matthew 4. And... and I want to underline, if you've never thought of this, Matthew 4, those first 11 verses, are really a special gift. It's one of the most amazing passages in the Scriptures, and the very fact we have it speaks of it being a gift from Jesus. This was a very private, intimate moment Christ had, and He shares the details of that moment with us. Not merely as a historical account, but I believe as a way for us to follow Him 
in victory using the Word of God. What's amazing is Jesus was alone and he gives us the conclusion to the Garden of Eden as he shows us how he, the last Adam, triumphs. Now, what's the setting? Verse 1 says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, it's interesting. Mark comments on that and says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. So, he was led, but yet there was a real, a real direction in this. This was not an accident. This didn't just happen. This was part of God's sovereign plan that he determined. The foreknowledge of God, he determined this event take place. As you notice, it was right after Christ's baptism in chapter 3. Then, uh, Mark adds that Jesus wasn't just in the wilderness, he was with the beasts. Now remember, the wilderness is an awful place. The Jews didn't like the wilderness. Uh, the wilderness uh, is where Azael was. That's, that's the, the, when they would take the scapegoat, they would send off that other scapegoat to the wilderness, the abode of the demons. And that's where uh, even our guide a few weeks ago in Israel, he says, oh, we hope those goats don't come back. You know, because they sent off every year all the sins of the people on a goat, in the scapegoat into the wilderness. Jesus went out where all the sins were sent. He went out where all the demons were thought to be, where the people that cut themselves and howled that were demonized lived out there in the wilderness, in the graves, in the caves. That's where he was, with the wild beasts, as it says in Mark 1.13. Also, it says here, as I noted in verse 2, he fasted for 40 days, so he was physically weak. And then, look at this. Verse 3, notice all the different words for Satan in this little account. The tempter, the devil, Satan. And we find Satan the adversary, the devil, the slanderer, Lucifer the fallen, the father of lies himself, the father of sin, of murder, of death, and the one for whom hell was made, the powerful king of darkness, at just Christ's weakest moment, comes to him. Isn't that how it is in our life? Isn't that what the holidays are like? I just talked to someone this week, and they said that they work here in town, and, and they have a, a special uh, job where they visit all of the various supermarkets in Tulsa, and they do that on a regular basis, and they said between Thanksgiving and Christmas, they see more frustration, more anger, more total despair in the stores. I mean, it's, it's the despair that there's not enough money, there's not enough time, nothing pleases anyone, there's pressure, family expectations, and everything else, and it just squeezes people until what's inside of them comes out, right? Like we're learning in Sunday school. It's what's inside the tea bag that comes out. It's not the hot water. The hot water just precipitates it. Well, Jesus is put into a hot situation and we're going to see what comes out. But Satan always comes at our weakest moment to hit right on what we are struggling with. I think to, to help us with this, so we need to take a moment and run back to chapter 10 of Hebrews. Could you do that with me? There's a verse which maybe will put the whole temptation account together. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7. And if you don't have this one marked, maybe you could mark it in your Bible because this is an explanation of why Christ came into the world. And he completely follows his pattern. In chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 5, and, and through 7, 7 is the key, but 5 explains it. It says in verse 5, Therefore, when he came into the world, this is Hebrews 10, 5, he said, Sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, now look at this, verse 7. Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me, here's the key, to do your will. Now what was Jesus Christ's marching orders while he was here on earth? He said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of my Father in heaven. When he was praying in the garden, he says, not my will, but what? Thine be done. Right. So Jesus, from the manger to the cross, had one channel. I didn't come to do my own way, to do my own thing. I came to do the will of my Father. I have yielded my life. I have chosen. I am going to do the will of my Father in heaven. That was his life. That was his purpose. And Hebrews 10 says that's why he came into the world, to do the will, verse 7, of God. Now, it's an interesting thought as you turn back to Matthew chapter 4 with me. Let me ask you this. Is that why we're here? I mean, really? Is that what you live for? Do you say, in my family, it's not my will, it's not my plans, it's not my dreams, it's your will I want done? How do I know what your will is? You happen to have given me your revealed will in this book. 
And if I don't know what the mind of God is, how am I going to lead my family in God's will? My life, my business, my marriage. Jesus said, I came to do your will. Well, everything Jesus did was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what Christ accomplished was a life of devoted obedience in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and transforms the sons of God, that's us, sons and daughters of God, to do the will of God. And so we have to choose to yield to that will because God wants us, like Christ, to say, I come to do your will. I hope that in your mind as we're going through the Gospel by Matthew chapter 4 that you see all of this was possible because Jesus Christ lived the perfect life. Do you want to have obedience in your life? Follow his perfect example. Want to do the will of God. Well, here are the penetrating truths we can get, and there are three of them. Real quickly, I want to show you from the temptation of Christ. Number one, the target or the goal of the temptation. Satan had three specific areas he was targeting. He had examined in the garden, Adam and Eve, and he found out that humans have a problem with their bodies, their souls, and their spirit. And there's a little, little entryway that he can get in there. So that's what he attacks with Christ. And we have all the way through the gospel Satan tempting Christ, but these 40 days were filled with an extra powerful spiritual struggle. It was the climax of his attack. Now here's the first one. Look at, at verse 3. When the tempter came to him, this is Matthew 4, 3, he said... If you're the Son of God, now look, this is not an accident. Command these stones to become what? Bread. Let me ask you, is there anything wrong with eating bread? No. That's a legitimate desire. Did you know what Satan does? Satan does not tempt me to climb you know, Mount Everest or to sail plane. I have no desire to do any of those ridiculous things. He tempts me in areas of legitimate desire. And you too. And eating is a normal, legitimate desire. But Satan always tempts us the same way, to fulfill our legitimate desires in an illegitimate way. What's that? Uh, legitimate desire for security? We illegitimately spend our whole life trying to make ourselves secure, and God says there's nowhere on earth that you can have foundations that are only in heaven. We have a legitimate desire to provide for our family. So we spend our whole life trying to amass enough and we never quite get enough so we feel we have financial security. God gives us a, a legitimate sexual desire. and He says that there is a way for that to be satisfied. Complete, in fact, not just satisfied, you can be intoxicated in marriage. If you have an eye single for one woman your whole life, for your wife. And he says if your eye be single, then you will be intoxicated with her. You know what happens? Most people in this world... On their way home to dinner, they stop and they're eating all the fast food and snacks and candy bars and everything else. And when they get home, they're not hungry. And that's what's gone wrong with so many marriages in America. There's so much snacking and, and grazing on, on the magazine racks and the Internet and, and prowling eyes. and, and they're never, There's never any hunger with an eye single for their wife. And legitimate desires, whether they be for security, for eating, for sexual desires, for anything else... Satan always attacks a legitimate desire. Man shall not, uh, I mean, commanding the stones to become bread. He takes a legitimate desire and he asks us to yield to him to, to satisfy it in an illegitimate way. What is this? Well, the first temptation, number one, is a physical attack. It's an attack on Christ's appetite. It's a desire to enjoy. Satan attacks Christ at the point of submission to the will of God in this. Is he going to submit to God and fulfill God's will when it comes to his appetite? It was an attack and a temptation to satisfy a legitimate desire by an illegitimate means. For us today, it's the whole realm of sensual things, of drugs, of alcohol, of eating, of our everyday lives, trying to get what only God can give and trying to fill our lives with pleasures of our own making instead of from God. Did you know if God has given you any legitimate desire, and every legitimate desire we were born with, all that I mentioned, God gave to us. Therefore, God has a perfect way to satisfy that desire. You know what we spend our lives doing? Ignoring God's perfect way and trying to find our own way. Trying to find our own way. And that's what the frustration and the guilt and all of the sadness comes from. Well, what's the answer? Look at what Jesus says. Verse 4. He answered and said, It 
is written. Now, what I think is interesting is uh, this Bible I'm reading right now happens to be a red letter Bible, so guess what? The uh, it is written is in red. The problem with that is that it makes it look like the red part's better than the black, right? That's why I don't like red letter Bibles because every word of the Bible is the Spirit of Christ inspiring the authors to write those. So all of them, I mean, if they're going to make red letter, they all should be red because he inspired them all. What they're saying is this is what Jesus said, but that doesn't make it any better than any other part of the Bible because every word of God is pure. But what I think is neat is Jesus said it is written. Now, Jesus was God the Son, and it is the Spirit of Christ that inspired the Word of God, it says in Peter. It says, they were moved by the Spirit of Christ which was in them. So the Old Testament prophets had the Spirit of Jesus Christ in them when they were inspired to write the Bible. So Jesus is in the Old Testament and all the way through, by the way. But Jesus, everything he said was Scripture. So he chooses to not give some new revelation. He chooses to what? Quote the book you hold in your hands. In fact, he quotes from Deuteronomy, a book that a lot of people aren't very familiar with. But he had mastered it. He had ingested it. So Jesus said, quoting the Bible, man shall not live by bread alone. Yes, we have legitimate desires, but every word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God tells us how to satisfy those desires God's way is what he's saying. He says, I'm not going to snap my finger and make a bunch of breads into stone, or I mean a bunch of stone into bread. Satan knew he could do that. He watched him at creation. He watched all the power. He watched all of his miracles. He, he knows what he can do. He had a legitimate hunger, need, and God says, I'm going to satisfy that, but I'm not going to let you satisfy it in an illegitimate way. I wonder this morning, have you understood the lesson of verse 4? That we don't live just this life, eating our bread and going through life and counting off the years until we die. We live by every word of God which proceeds from the mouth of God. You really are incomplete, and you're unable to live life until you and I say, God, I come to do your will, and this is your will. Show me what you want to do from this book. I yield my life to you. You know, Jesus said, I gave my life to thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom me and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What have you given for me? Do you know what we can give to Christ? You want to give him something this morning? Say with Jesus, I come to do your will, O God. I come to do your will. Not my will, thy will. And I will not go my own way. I want to go your way. And if I want to know what your way is, you've told me. See, that's what Jesus is saying. First attack was the physical attack on his appetite. Secondly, look what happens. Satan doesn't stop there. He gets shut out of the body. So he's going for the soul now. So the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. That's interesting, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? What did they ride in? You know, did they fly? Could anybody see them? I mean, there's a lot of stuff. It's very interesting, all this, and it doesn't tell us, so we don't speculate. But it's very interesting. So they're up there on the pinnacle of the temple, and the devil says, "If you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written." And he happens to have memorized a few verses somewhere along the way. He shall give his angels charge over you. And it's interesting that that right here. He's quoting Psalm 91 twice. And verse 12 of Psalm 91, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So the devil is now tempting Jesus. His ambition, his desire to achieve, it's a mental attack. It's to, to get him, and I call this, the jump temptation was the devil attacking Christ and his reliance on God and God's timing. Now look at this. A stunt and a dazzling display of presumption, all were contrary to God's plan. Can you imagine how many people would have come to Christ with this skydiving deal? I mean, the temple was the hub of, of Jerusalem, and here's Jesus, the highest point, and I'm sure that he could have got some angels to blow the horn, he would have gotten right on the edge, and everyone would have said, no, no, don't jump, and he got, and he says, follow me, and he jumped off, and, everybody, and then he would have landed on his feet, and the angels got him, and they all would have bowed down to him. Wouldn't that have been a neat way to get attention? Yeah, but it wasn't God's way. And so often we are so prone to the stunts. To the, we don't follow God's plan. We're always trying to do the spectacular instead of the simple, instead of the biblical, instead of the pattern God's given us. We think that, that if we get some superstar to, to get saved, then everyone will follow. That's just not God's way. We should really think about that because Satan's still doing this. He's still attacking our ambitions, our desires to achieve. And the attack, according to 
Dr. J. Oswald Sanders was the temptation to produce a spiritual result in an unspiritual way. Do you ever think about that? We're so tempted to do that. We, we want God's way, but we get it our way. And that is a sin against God. You know, this is a whole realm of rivalry and externalism, of pride, of haughtiness, of self-reliance. What did Jesus do when Satan told him to jump and neglect God's timing, get it all now, and get it all your own way? Verse 7, Jesus said to him, it's written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It's interesting, Jesus leaves off the last few words of Deuteronomy, which said this, as you tempted him in Massa. He only quotes the beginning of Deuteronomy 6.16. But you know, if you look back, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says the Old Testament Scriptures were written for our learning. That we, through what God did with them, might learn. They tried God ten times in the wilderness. Ten times they tempted God. And that's why God finally ended up killing them all and only letting uh, Joshua and Caleb come into the Promised Land of those that were alive of that generation. Why? Because they tempted the Lord. And you can read about all that in Deuteronomy 6 and also in Numbers. But what the Lord says is, in the mental attack, in ambition, the desire to achieve, I am not going to go my own way. I didn't come to do my will. I didn't come to have my own timing. I came in God's timing. That's why Galatians 4, 4, and 5 is so neat. In the fullness of time. God sent forth Christ. If you want to do God's work, do it in God's way, in God's timing. You know, there's so much in the Scripture about waiting on the Lord, being patient, trusting in Him. That's against our human nature. We don't want to wait. We don't want to trust. We want to go. We want to do. We want it now. And it's that whole temptation of ambition. Jesus Christ says, don't tempt the Lord your God. Follow Him. Follow His will. Do His will. Here's the last one. Look at verse 8. Here's the last of Satan's spiritual attacks. And it's this. And again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain. I mentioned earlier, it could be, you know, Mount Everest or something, or it could have been right there in Jericho. Uh, and looking down at those gardens of uh, Rome, the imperial gardens Herod had reproduced. But whatever, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And maybe this was a spiritual thing, and he just kind of did a, a panorama of the world. I don't know. And Satan said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Remember, he's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in children of disobedience. He says, I will bring the whole world to your feet. You don't have to tramp around preaching. I'll bring them all to you. If you, the end of verse 9, will fall down and worship me. Isn't that something that Satan wants God to worship him? It's the, just the... Uh, essence of his pride. Verse 10, And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, and here he goes, third time, quotes the Bible. This time, he's quoting again from Deuteronomy. And he says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Now, if you've never noticed this before, notice the order. What Before you serve God, what's supposed to come first? Worship. Worship comes before service. If you're only serving the Lord and never worshiping Him, then your service will get dry, you'll get burned out, you'll get discouraged, you'll get disgruntled, you'll get hurt and pull out. But if you worship first and then serve, that worship serves as a buffer to protect that service. So you do it in the power of Christ, in the spirit of Christ, with the attitude of Christ, you see, for the reward of Christ. It's very wonderful. The, the order God says... He says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. And here, this, this bow-down temptation was offering the possibility of Christ to circumvent the cross in Calvary. It was an escape to pain, escape to suffering. Again, it was a temptation to get God's way in an ungodly way. And this is the whole realm. When you think about it, of materialism, of greed, of possessiveness, of trust in riches, of worldliness, of using Satan's means to achieve God's purposes. And God says, no, that's not the way that you don't serve me in your human way and then try to worship me. You start by worshiping me, which is having a proper view of God, of yielding to that, that proper view of God, and having all service flow out of that proper view of God. That's the way I accept it. Well, it's amazing that Christ used a very simple method when he faced temptation. In fact, if you analyze Jesus' words, he doesn't say very much in these 11 verses. Did you know his response was not clever, it wasn't novel, it wasn't sophisticated? In fact, 
a child could understand exactly what he was saying. I mean, he didn't get up there and elevated mumbo-jumbo stuff. He just said, no, I'm going to do God's will. No, I'm not. And he just was so simple. He used a scriptural method. For every temptation, he had already discovered an appropriate scripture. For each temptation, he quoted that appropriate scripture. What does that mean to us today? Well, let's look back at Hebrews for just a second. Let me conclude with two verses from Hebrews. And I'm going to read you some others. But Hebrews chapter 2, very interesting. 2.14 and 2.18 of Hebrews 2. This is what Jesus, again, the whole book of Hebrews is explaining how the Old Testament relates to Christ and how he fulfills all this. It's just a wonderful book. But 2.14 says, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now, look at verse 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus went through temptation so he can say to us that there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful because God the Son has already been there. He's already been tempted through the lust of the flesh, through the lust of the eyes, and through the pride of life, through the body, through the mind, and through the spirit. He says, I've gotten all three channels. I've gotten Satan's best on every hand. And I have triumphed. Why? Because he called down thunderbolts or legions of angels or created something to... No. He didn't, do it. he didn't do anything you and I can't do. Did you realize that? He quotes the same Bible you hold. He quotes the same words you can read and you have in your heart. He did not do any supernatural sci-fi stuff. He just did the simple stuff. And he said it's through the Word of God. Now... Look at chapter 4 of Hebrews, verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. That's Jesus. Tempted with the lust of flesh. Tempted with the lust of eyes. Tempted with the pride of life. He was sinless. He was non picari He could not sin, but yet he was 100% human. And Satan got him when he was weak with hunger. He got him when he, he offered him this, this jump deal, getting out of God's timing, and he offered him, if he would circumvent the cross, he'd get all the people of the world. He, he hit him with three temptations of the same type we get. He was in all points tempted like as we are. Look at this. Yet without sin, verse 16, Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what that means? means every time we're tempted, God leaves an open exit door. And Jesus Christ is standing in that open exit door and He's looking at us and He's saying, I've already been here. I've already suffered being tempted. Come on out. You don't have to give in. You don't have to. Use the Word of God like I use the Word of God. Say no to sin like I said no to sin. Use the Word of God. Trust God's timing. Trust that God can satisfy your desires in a legitimate way. Trust that God will give you a godly heritage in His own time and His own way. Trust God. What do we use? We'll back up to verse 12 of chapter 4. The Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. He says, use the living and abiding Word. Use the Word of God. And you also will be a more than conqueror. I'd like to close with sharing with you what the last Adam brought us. His total triumph showed us that we can overcome Satan with the Word of God. Satan's total defeat shows that he is exposed as being in line for final defeat and he can be resisted. We don't need to be afraid of him or our flesh or the world. They are all crushed by Christ's victory. We should have total assurance because Jesus met and conquered Satan. Through Jesus we're more than conquerors. No temptation comes, but God is able to give us that exit door out. How do we do that? Well, I like, and I'm going to conclude with this, I want to read to you 
what Julia H. Johnston wrote. You'll recognize this. She wrote a poem about victory in Christ, about what Jesus Christ accomplished when he, the last Adam, met Satan face to face and, and defeated Satan on every hand. This is what she wrote. I think you know it and I think you'll love it. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Dark is the stain we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, you that are longing to see His face, will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Hebrews 4.15 we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weakness. He was in the garden of the wilderness with Satan. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to His throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's going to be times of need. We're going to be tempted. You can be tempted either through our body's desires and fulfill them in an illegitimate way, a legitimate desire. Fulfilled with the whole emotions in mind and timing deal or the whole pride of life and, and running our own show and doing our own way. Whatever it is, Jesus said, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that's greater than all of our sin. Grace that's able to triumph as we use the sword of the Spirit over every attack of Satan. Let's bow before the Lord. If you've never done this before, why don't you, right where you're sitting, in the quietness of your heart, in the privacy of your will, why don't you just say what Jesus said? I come to do your will, O God. You know, if you settle that once and for all in your life, it's called consecration, yieldedness. Sometimes we just have to renew it. This morning would be a good day to do that, to say, I don't want to do my will, but thine be done. Father in heaven, where we sit, we sit before you. You were tempted in all points like we are yet without sin because you had determined that your life's direction and heart's desire was to do the will of the Father. Father in heaven, I say with Jesus and all of us say here this morning, not my will, but thine be done. I come before you now to do your will. I pray that many this morning will make that commitment and then that they will start searching for your will because it's written down and they hold it in their hands. They've hidden it in their hearts. They just need to say, I want to do your will. I want to worship you and as I worship you, I'll serve you. And I pray that you'd bless us to that end as we remember Satan's attacks, as we remember the last Adam triumphed through the Word. May we also, for Jesus' precious name, we ask this. Amen. God bless you as you go.